All right, Numbers chapter 35. We're actually going to uh, pick up a um, little bit into it, and we're going to be talking about the cities of refuge in Numbers chapter 35, and we'll be starting at verse 9. All right, let's go ahead and, um, and pray. Dear God, we do just ask that you teach us and minister to us, God, that we would be those people of refuge, and we would find our refuge in you, even as we look at these cities. And, and uh, Lord, may we learn to obey you and know the blessings of obedience, not see obedience as restriction, but as ways to stay close, ways to bless you, ways to be uh, used in a greater way and find great satisfaction and be protected, God. And so help our rebellious hearts not to rebel. We do just lift up this season as well, God, and just pray, uh, Lord, for those who don't know you and the lonely and the lost, and may you draw them to yourself in this season, we pray. We love you, Lord. We praise you. Just teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Numbers chapter 35, verse 9. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. Now remember with me, these people start off as slaves 40 years earlier. The faithless have all died in the desert. And they're about to go be warriors. They were slaves. They were brick makers, workers. Um, before that, they were merely herders of animals. And now God has trained them to be an army. And he's giving them standards and rules that once they go into the city or into the nation and they win that nation conquer that nation, they will have rules to rule them. Now, we're coming to the end of these rules, and then Deuteronomy is a restatement within a month before they go in and take over Jericho. And so we see these rules about the city of refuge, and we hear about the avenger. So in the ancient culture of Israel, it wasn't the government's job to necessarily avenge a murder. Each extended family would have someone in that family that would be called or recognized as the avenger, the person that would carry out justice for that family. And there wasn't that many murders within the nation, and so someone may have that role but never have to use it. But what would happen is if someone had murdered a family member, the avenger, again, was responsible, not the government for avenging the family's blood. In Genesis 9:6 it says whoever sheds a man blood a man's blood by man his blood shall be shed for in the image of God God made man. Now this is for uh, first degree premeditated purposeful murder. That's the idea behind this. This is not like oops got in a car accident, you know, and or uh, swung a bat let go of it and and hurts, you know, it's not an accident. Um, it, it's it's purposeful first degree murder. And the reason why people were put to death is because God made man in his image. God made man in his image. And so you're disrespecting the image of God. You're disrespecting the person of God by killing one of his images, putting, uh, murdering. Now, killing is a different thing, but murder is premeditated, selfish murder. And understand, in that day, the nation had no police force to investigate crimes and prosecute criminals. And so if someone was innocent, if it was an accident or they didn't do anything and they heard someone was after them, they had to be protected from the family members who would take justice into their own hands as the Bible had told them to. And so they had to have a place, a safe place where they could go. And it was called the City of Refuge. And so the fugitive was safe until the elders and most likely the priests, the leaders of that city, 
held court and decided whether he was guilty or not or what type of guilt he was guilty of. And it really did save people from bad situations and from others taking the law into their own hands. But the system did have weaknesses because you have someone dying at the hands of another, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's murder, right? Because we do have something called manslaughter. You know, someone walks out and cro- uh, across the street and you hit them with your car and, and you did everything to avoid them. Your car, with you behind the wheel, killed them. But you're not guilty of murder. That's a total accident. You have other things where you're goofing off with somebody and messing around and, 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 and then someone gets killed, you know, and that's not murder either, you know. Uh, you have job accidents or you have job accidents where you, uh, you haven't been careful with your equipment and someone dies because of your equipment and you've been negligent. Now you're more responsible than merely an accident or goofing around, you know. And so there's, there's these different levels. And so people had to be judged. And, and, and um, you know, so not every time that someone dies at the hands of another is it worthy of murder. Therefore, a person either suspected of murder who's fearful of the avenger, even though he hasn't murdered, or whether someone who was guilty of manslaughter or even negligent manslaughter, or someone who was guilty of murder, they would take their chances by running to the city of refuge. Now, if you were found guilty, understand you were handed over to that family member. (laughs) You would die. And there was no safety for someone who committed murder. If you never went to the city and they found you, you could be killed. Now, these were Levitical cities. The priest would oversee the verdict of the situation and determine if the person was to be handed over or not. Verse 13 goes on and it says, And the cities which you give, you shall have six cities of refuge. And you shall appoint three cities on this side of the Jordan and three cities you shall appoint in the land of Canaan, which will be cities of refuge. Six cities shall be for the refuge of the children of Israel, for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills a person accidentally may flee there. And so we do have a map up there of the cities of refuge, and we see that they're very well spread out and fairly, given the landscape, fairly evenly um, evenly placed. Now there's the, the little place at the top of Manasseh on the uh, western side of the Jordan River, and uh, in there, but still they could run to Ramoth, they could run to Kadesh, or they could run to Shechem. And so they were tried, they they tried to put them within two days foot journey of anywhere in the nation of Israel. And so they could get there and be found safe. Now the idea of this strategic placing of the cities uh, for us today would would just kind of show God is strategic. He, he, He never leaves anybody away from salvation. He is always there. He is reachable to someone who's in need, and you never have to go too far for help. You see, David was in a spot many times. He was fleeing from Saul and the land of the Philistines, and he needed the protection of God. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encaps all around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and blessed is the man who trusts in him. In verse 8, in another translation, it says, And blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And so Jesus is our refuge. Now, for us as believers, and we're going to talk even more about that in in a moment, he is our refuge. But one of the things about these people outside of the cities is that they're not safe until they get into the city of refuge. And it's also interesting 
that it was said in, in Jewish law uh, over time that these cities of refuge always had to have clear roads and clear signage to them. People always had to have access to these places and they weren't allowed to lock their gates at night because people 24-7 had to be able to get into these places to seek peace and to seek refuge. Now, when I was in uh, Hawaii on the surfing tour, I uh, went to a church called the City of Refuge. And uh, it, was, it was an awesome church. I felt a little out of place. It was a, it was a black charismatic church and, and uh, um, just friendly people. But I was, I was with a, a guy that was like 6'3 and, uh, and whiter than me. And, <laughs> you know, and the guy couldn't clap, you know. And we were like standing out like sore thumbs, you know. But um, it was called the City of Refuge, which is a good place. And I'm glad they were very friendly there and loving there. And they just accepted us in. And they, they could care less uh, what color we, we were, you know. And I just thought, that's awesome. We are called to be a people of refuge, you know. We are called to be accepting of those that are lost in the world. Oh, pastor, you want anybody to come into the church? I'm not talking about people being members and leaders and teachers in the church. I'm talking about people being able to come in and find out who God is. Because what we do so often is people come in from the world looking for some type of refuge and finding out if it could be in the church. And what do we do? We don't introduce them to Jesus. We don't introduce them to peace. And we don't introduce them to love. We start telling them how bad they are. And it's interesting because a lot of people already know that they're bad. You know? Um, we're, in, um, we're in Brazil... And uh, on a mission trip, and it was interesting. Dave, were you on that trip when we had that young guy that was all amped out that just always wanted to tell everybody? That you were on that trip, right? You were on that trip. We're, we're at Ipanema Beach. The surf was cranking, and uh, we had a blind guy with us. You were on that one, right? Okay. So anyways, um, you know, so actually Dave had given his testimony, and, uh, and then this guy got in front of all of these Brazilians, who had stopped, and they were very polite, and they were listening to the story. And this guy just proceeded to tell them how horrible they were and that they were all going to hell. And then he goes, anybody here want to accept Jesus? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Do you remember that? And everybody just kind of turns and they walk off, like slowly. You know, it's just the weirdest thing. Now, I'm not saying that, that some people don't think they need a Savior. And, and yeah, you do need to be able to go through the Ten Commandments to go, no, no, you do need a Savior. But we're talking about we're in the middle of Rio, okay? And a lot of these people live in slums. A lot of these people survive by stealing. You know, their life isn't good, and they've been molested. And they've been trashed, you know? And um, so it was, it was uh, you know, and my message so often is when I'm, when I'm teaching is uh, not that God hates you, not that you're going, you know, not, not that you need to change so that you can go to heaven, you know, or, or not that Jesus came to point his finger at you. You know, the Bible in, in, in John chapter 3 tells us men are condemned already because they have not believed. Right? Because they haven't believed. And it also says in John chapter 3 that Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Right? Because the world is already condemned. It's already there. And so it was really uh, interesting because um, he was a young man and he was zealous and he was just so excited about this new method of witnessing that he was just going to tell everybody how bad they were. So then uh, we waited about a half an hour and then we did our skit again. We gathered a bunch more people and, and then um, um, this guy named Mickey, this blind guy, gave his testimony and then I shared with the people, I just go, you know what? We're here because God loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to be able to be with him. And you can't be. Because there's something separating you from God. It's sin. You know, so I told them they're sinners, but not, <laughs> you know. That's not the only thing I told them. But God didn't, God could have left us alone. He didn't have to come. He could have left us alone and we would have just went to hell. But he didn't do that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if you believe in him, 
So people's sins already have sent them to hell. And so if someone is engaging in adulterous acts and homosexuality and drug use or drug selling or murder or whatever, even if they weren't a murderer, even if they weren't uh, sexually perverse, even if they weren't a thief, they'd still be going to hell because they have tons of sins. The reason they're going to hell is because they don't believe. And God sent Jesus because he loved the people so that they would believe. And so I just explained this message. And then I said, we're here and we, we have interpreters. Interpreters, you know. <laughs> so it was all through an interpreter. And we had maybe 15 people on the trip and we had a bunch of interpreters. And I said, we would love to talk with you about knowing Jesus. And I turned around to set some things down to go find someone to minister to. And everybody in our group was talking to everybody out there already. You know. And and, and one of the issues is, and one of the hard balances in the church is this, we are about holiness. If you're a believer, you do need to start walking in holiness because you're not going to enjoy your walk with God. And you're not going to be a tool for God. And so it's your satisfaction and your joy. Your salvation is dealt with. Your sins are forgiven. But you want to be used. You want to be fulfilled. You want to be purposeful. You want to change other people's lives for eternity. You want to be a part of the game. You know, you want to be on the front lines. You want to know that you've had an effect and be purposeful in this life. And God trains us that way. And one of the paths to happiness is holiness. In fact, that is the path to happiness, is holiness. Not sensual pleasure, but it's holiness. And, and so the, the balance is, yeah, we, we love holiness, and we're going to encourage people to draw near to God, to bring Him good pleasure, and to be purposeful and useful in their lives. At the same time, we don't just reject everybody who's a sinner because all of us would have to reject each other, and this place would be empty. Because I've been walking with the Lord for 26 years, and I'm still a sinner. What's your problem? Pastor Rod, you know, what a loser. Darn right I am. And I got Jesus, and I want to give Jesus to other people. And so I do want people to be able to come in and feel love, but I do want them to get the message. And so if people reject this church, may it be because we've given love and the right message, and that they loved their sin better or more than the gospel. May it be for that reason, not because we were jerks to them, you know, or made them feel like they were less than human. Remember, the death penalty was given because the image of God was disrespected. And when we look at a rich person and we look at a street person, and and we're willing to think that that person is less the image of God than a rich person, we've fallen into that. We've now disrespected an image of God. And the image of God is in every human being. In every human being. At the same time, we don't let go and we don't compromise just to fill the church either. Because if we just leave people in a sinful state, we're not doing them any better, any, any good either. You know, And so it is this, this struggle to, the, where's the line? But I think we're always fighting for that line. We want people to be loved and we also want to point to a holy, righteous God. But aren't all of us in that battle? The closer we get to God, the more it hurts and the more joy we have. Right? It's like, it's the pleasure and the pain altogether, you know, because the closer we get to Him, the the more we realize we're sinful, but the closer we are to Him. You know? And, And it's just this weird, you know, your flesh rejects, but your spirit longs for. And we're in this, we're in this battle. So may it be that, that we are those that bring refuge to others. May, we, may it be that we are the priests that keep people and say, hey, we can introduce you to safety and to peace. And so do people feel comfortable coming to you with their problems? Let's say even in the church. Do you feel like you can come to someone in the church and they would receive you? Romans fifteen seven says, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us. And do it to the glory of God. Ephesians 4, 2, With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bear with one another in love. Wow. It 
Psalm 41, 6, God is our refuge and our strength, a very pleasant help in trouble. More than 15 other times, God is talked about as our refuge, the guy that we can snuggle into. Hebrews 6.18, that by two immutable things in which is, it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. We can flee into Jesus. He has not lied about the fact that he is our refuge and our strength. So God is our refuge. Now understand, again, Jesus and the cities of refuge are within easy reach of those in need. Jesus and the cities of refuge are open to all, not just the Israelites, as to the stranger as well. Jesus and the cities of refuge, be, refuge became a place where one in need would live. You wouldn't go there on vacation. If you needed to live there, you would. Understand this, believer. We need Jesus, <laughs> you know? We need him. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge are the only alternative for the one in need. They couldn't go anywhere else. They couldn't make up their own rules. They would die, right? Because that guy's coming. That family member's coming. He's going to take you out. Oh, uh, but I, I declare this, this city safe now. No, you can't do it. You've got to do it his way. Both Jesus and the cities of refuge are provided for protection only within their boundaries. You can't be outside of Jesus and get into heaven. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Definite article, the, the, the. And no one comes to the Father but through me. And a city of refuge the only was the only place. And you had to stay within those boundaries. You go outside, you're going to die. It's like saying, you know what, I was really close to the ark when the flood came, so I was cool. You're not. You're outside the ark. You're either inside or outside. If you're halfway in and halfway out, the door shuts, you get squished. You know? Both Jesus and the cities of refuge, in Jesus, in Jesus and the cities of refuge, complete freedom comes with the death of a high priest. Now understand, what would happen is they would be the person guilty of, of manslaughter where it was a criminal offense would be stuck in the city of refuge until the high priest died. Once the high priest died, they'd be free. So it might be one year, it might be 20 years, but it was in God's hands. Okay, And so the death of the high priest bought, brought freedom. But a distinction is the cities of refuge only help the innocent of murder. Jesus helps everybody, even the murderer. And so he goes even further. It goes on in verse 16, back in Numbers 35, it says, But if he strikes them with an iron implement so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer sh shall surely be put to death. And if he strikes them with a stone in the hand by which one could die, and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he strikes them with a wooden hand weapon by which one could die, and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely put, be put to death. The avenger of blood himself shall put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. Now the idea is a deadly weapon purposefully used. And so there's other standards, but this is one of the standards. You're in big trouble if you point a gun at somebody and you purposefully shoot it, right? <laughs> and that's what it's saying. If you are purposefully taking something and using it as a weapon that you know can do damage, it shows intent to murder. Okay, so that's one of the standards. Okay, um, verse 20 if he pushes him out of hatred or, or while lying in wait hurls something at him so he dies or in enmity he strikes him with the hand so that he dies, the one who struck him shall surely be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. And so this is the motive, the purpose behind it. He had a reason to, and he fulfilled that reason to kill someone else. Verse 22, but however, if he pushes him suddenly without enmity, 
or throws anything out at him without lying in wait, or uses a stone by which a man could die, throwing it at him without seeing him so that he dies while he is not the not his enemy or seeking his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood according to these judgments. So the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall return him to the city of refuge where he had fled, and he shall remain there until the death of the high priest who has anointed him with holy oil. And so without premeditation, without purposeful intent. That's when you start stepping into that middle ground between murder and just an absolute stupid accident, right? And that's where you have the justice system within these cities. And so the congregation shall judge. Now, that's kind of (laughs) scary Because we know that first impressions say a lot, and then you hear the story and you're like, what? (laughs) You know, that's totally different. It's amazing some of the stories I hear about people, and then I hear the other side of the story, I go, oh, that ain't so bad. (laughs) You know, I understand that. So the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood. And so they will protect if his story adds up, okay? And then he'll remain there if it was uh, deserving of remaining there until the death of the high priest. So it was a kind of prison system without the bars. You could be a captive in your city of refuge, but instead of having a certain number of years on your sentence, you would have to wait until the death of the high priest. But you'd be able to be productive, you'd be able to live life, but you were limited. It was a punishment. But as you would have to wait for the high priest, the story goes that the mothers of the priests would always supply lots of food and clothing to those (laughs) who were under manslaughter charges so they wouldn't be praying for or plotting against the death of their sons. (laughs) So understand, the idea is the innocent go free, the guilty of murder die, and the one guilty of manslaughter is punished but protected and not killed. Verse 26, if the manslayer at any time goes outside the limits of the city of refuge where he fled, the avenger of blood finds him outside of the limits of the city of refuge and the avenger of of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood because he should have remained in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. So if he was not abiding under the rules, he could be killed. But when the high priest died, the sentence was over and he could go home. And if the avenger of blood came and killed him, the avenger of blood is now a murderer. Now he has an avenger of blood on his back. But he actually, if he murders in that way, he will will eventually be put to death. Okay. Verse 29 And these things shall be a statute of judgment to you throughout your generation in all your dwellings. Whomever kills the person, or kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the testimony of witnesses. But one witness is not sufficient testimony against a person for the death penalty. Not enough to condemn a murderer to death. And furthermore, in Deuteronomy earlier, it tells us, or later, excuse me, in Deuteronomy, we're told, chapter 17, verses 6 and 7, it tells us that the person that is accusing and those that are eyewitnesses accusing, they need to be willing to put that person to death. They need to be the ones standing in and saying, okay, they are guilty of death. This is righteousness. And I'm, I'm willing to carry that out on God's behalf. Remember when Paul put Stephen to death? He was one of the witnesses saying this man was worthy of death. When Jesus was with the woman caught in adultery, he says, who is innocent among you? Let him cast the first stone. There weren't witnesses there. They all walked away and they realized that we can't do this. They're trying to get Jesus to do what they were supposed to legally do and they weren't willing to. 
you know, and, and so he told her, neither do I depart. He was following the law. Many people say, well, that wasn't right. She was caught in adultery. It was perfectly within the law. He was not a witness of her committing adultery. All the accusers were gone. No death sentence took place. Nothing. And besides, the problem was, the man was never brought into the case either. Okay. But what does this mean to us on the witness of, of at least one or two, or at least two, not one, but at least two? Early on in our country, you know that uh, uh, eight out of ten uh, murders, uh, when they are took to trial, eight out of ten people accused of murder got off. But those two, because they didn't have two eyewitnesses. And that was the standard. But if you had two eyewitnesses, they were taken out that very day and hung or shot. They were dead. That was justice. But they did believe what the scriptures had to say. But see, here's the thing, guys. Is it worse to let the guilty go free or to kill the innocent? Let me ask you, in our justice system right now, in our DA offices across the nation, do you think it's, in their minds, it's worse to let the guilty go free or the innocent suffer? I would say for political reasons, everybody wants to be tough on crime, not just on crime. And so in our country, we're no longer the land of the liberty, we're the land of the incarcerated. And there's so many crazy things going on and our, our system needs to go back to some common sense stuff because if DA offices run in a political situation only accountable to the people once every four years, they can, they can accuse and they can overcharge people. What if you ran a, a, a stop sign and the DA comes up with a charge of murder? You didn't have an accident, anything. You just ran the stop line, you get a ticket, you go in there, the DA has now gone before the grand jury, manipulated them, and now you have a charge of murder against you. Are you going to settle? And you're not going to settle for a traffic ticket. You're going to have to settle for something way worse than that. But it makes them look good, doesn't it? Oh, we settled so many things out of court. But man, it's crazy. Okay, and... And, and we just need to understand, I'm not saying everybody in government is bad. I'm saying everybody's bad. You know, corporations are greedy. Yeah. What about our government officials? Are they greedy? Yeah. Do they lie? Yeah. Do used carsmen, sells cars, used car salesmen rip people off? Yeah. But do pastors rip off their congregations? Yeah. They do that. Not all of them, but, <laughs> you know, it happens. Because you have some honest used car salesmen, too. But that used car salesman is still a sinner. Even if he's honest, he's still sitting somewhere. You know, and, and, and so we get all weird, and we just think, oh, the, you know, all this is perfect. You know what? There's one perfect judge. His name is Jesus Christ. And we're not going to see perfect justice until heaven. And the reason we're going to rejoice in perfect justice is because we have grace. Because none of us want perfect justice on our life. That's a scary thing to ha fall into the hands of a living God like that. You know. So, um, it took two witnesses. But what about us? We're fair-minded and we've never you know, cast the first stone. Maybe never sat on a jury in, in a murder case or whatever. And Hey, I agree with that. But have you guys ever heard someone just insinuate something about someone else and you believe it and you condemn them in your mind? We do that. Not on two witnesses. Not even on one witness. We'll do it on the testimony of one gossip. And we will condemn someone. And it talks about in the scriptures, you know, Tim, 1 Timothy 5.19. Do not bring an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Why? Because elders always have shots taken at them. And if you're in a leadership position, you know this. If you're a boss, you know this. You're going to get shots at you. 
And, and, and the church can't move forward if, if people are just taking shots at the leadership all the time. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you know. So you go to the next church, just do it again. Man, every church I go to, the, the elders seem to be so bad. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Maybe it's just you and your gossip, <laughs> you know. And the church can do this. If a matter is false, it doesn't become true because many people hear it or many people repeat it either. You need people that are solid witnesses, that have a clear story, that are willing to stand behind their story. Proverbs twelve seventeen: He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Proverbs eighteen seventeen: The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. Wow. Yeah, some people can come in and say uh, I saw Pastor Rod at a bar then someone comes I'm just heartbroken Pastor and I've, I've had all my friends praying for me and you know we, we had a prayer group of 50 people there to pray for you because we heard you were at a bar you know and then when it comes out I was leaning against a, 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 a railing you know <laughs> at a supermarket or something you know I don't know. You know, it's like, hear the other side of the story because they're that bad sometimes, you know. And uh, people will just want to believe it because it goes down like honey to hear something bad about someone else. And we need to understand that about ourselves. And if you are susceptible to gossip, you need to start being offended that people gossip to you. I already know too much about people just being a pastor. I don't want to know anything more bad about people. (laughs) I'm not looking out to find things bad about people. You know, and then someone comes up to me and they start telling me about how bad this pastor that they previously had was. And uh, if you ever do that to me, you'll watch me, I'll start to glare off. Because you know what's going on in my mind? The next pastor you have, I'll be that guy. And two, most pastors don't get into the ministry to get rich or famous or to get pats on the back. Most pastors I know were called and make great sacrifices and carry a whole lot of burdens. And here you are in our church gossiping about a pastor, and I'm just assuming you're, you're a hurt sheep and you need to grow up. <laughs> you know? But if you're trying to get me to hate somebody that I don't need to hate, I don't want to hate. Right? The temptation's already there to to, to, of pride. Oh yeah, I'm better than that guy. Man, I'm getting ripped off. You're getting ripped off when someone gossips to you about someone else because they're ruining a relationship for you that you haven't seen at all. And we will just listen and we'll hear it. You know nothing about the situation and all of a sudden you hate this person. Have you ever had somebody tell you a bunch of stuff about a person and you form this horrible opinion about that person? Later on, you got to know them and you're kind of waiting for the fangs to come out and they never do. You're like, what happened? Well, they must have gotten better all of a sudden. Or that other person was just taking shots. I've had it to where I've had an attitude against somebody because someone was sharing all these bad things to me about them. And then all of a sudden they turned around, they're their best friend again. Really? You know, and and so, guys, try not to receive in gossip about other people. And here at this church, you know, just, you know, or change the subject. And people will do that with me. When I start slipping into places where I shouldn't go, they'll change the subject or they'll, (laughs) you know, it's like, well, thank you very much because we're all capable of it. Right? Right? And so these false witnesses, don't be a false witness, whether it just be someone's character or whether it be in an actual crime. Verse 31 goes on to say, Moreover, he shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. And you shall take no ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the priest. For these crimes there is no way to pay off a fine. 
they need to serve out their sentences. Verse 33, so you shall not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Therefore, do not defile the land which you inhabit, in the midst of which I dwell, for the For I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. The way for a country not to be polluted by the blood spilt by murderers is justice, real justice. Not hard on crime, real justice. God hates injustice. Our country is polluted in this area. We protect monstrous murderers. And again, there's political reasons to overcharge and manipulate to put the innocent in jail. And then worse than that, for the sake of convenience, we murder the most innocent among us through abortion. And so there's a lot of blood on this land. Let's go ahead and read chapter 36, and I'm going to make a few comments about it as we finish out the book of Numbers. It says, Now the chief fathers of the families, the children of Gilead, the son of Mature, the son of Manasseh of the families of the sons of Joseph came near and spoke before Moses and before the leaders, the chief fathers of the children of Israel. And they said, the Lord commanded my Lord Moses to give the land as an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance to our brother uh, Zelophehad to his daughters. Now, if they are married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel, then their inheritance will be taken out of the inheritance of our fathers and it will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry. So it will be taken from the lot of our inheritance. And when the Jubilee of the children of Israel comes and their inheritance will be added to the inheritance of the tribe into which they marry, so their inheritance will be taken away from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. Okay, remember back a while before this, Moses, people said to, to Moses, they said, we got a problem because there's only girls in the tribe. So now, if, um, if uh, when I die, all our family plot is gone. And so he says, against tradition, the family plot would then go to the daughters. But what if these women married outside of their tribe? Now their tribe ownership or the land ownership now goes to another tribe. And so they were uh, worried about this. So this is the problem that's being brought up. Something else, a solution was brought up, but it brought on another problem. Okay? Verse 5. Then Moses commanded the children... Oh, am I in the right place? Yes. Um, Israel, according to the word of the Lord, saying, what the tribe of the sons of Joseph speaks is right. Remember, God wanted those tribes to hold on to the land. And even within the tribe or even if they loaned the land out to another uh, tribe for a while, what would happen is the year of Jubilee would come around and all the land would go back to the original tribe every time. Okay? But if the women married men in another tribe, that wouldn't happen. Okay? This is verse 6, what the Lord commanded concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, let them marry whom they think best, but they may marry only within the family of their father's tribe. Okay? So they're limited. So the inheritance of the children of Israel shall not change from, the tri- from tribe to tribe, for every one of the children of Israel shall keep the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be the wife of one of the family of her father's tribe, so that the children of Israel may possess the inheritance of his fathers. Thus no inheritance shall change hands from one tribe to another, but every tribe of the children of Israel shall keep its own inheritance. Just as the Lord commanded Moses, so did the daughters of Zelophehad. For Mahla, Terza, Hagla, Melkri, <laughs> Hagla. Did they call her Hog for short? I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> Milka and Noah, the daughters of uh, Zelo, uh, they had, were married to the sons of their father's brothers. 
they were married into the families of the children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in the tribe of their father's, father's family. These are the commandments and judgments which the Lord commanded the children of Israel by the hand of Moses in the plains of Moab, by the Jordan, across from Jericho. Done with the book of Numbers. Um, what do we have to say about that chapter? Well, listen, they were limited, weren't they? God put a standard and said, this is the standard. Live within it and you will be blessed. Is there, is there a problem with that? With rebellious people, there is, right? And it's the spirit of rebellion that says, you know, I like this part of the Bible, but not that part of the Bible. I like these three restrictions. I don't like these restrictions. I can live within these. I don't need to live within those. But listen, blessings come with restrictions. Lots of incredible, wonderful promises that God has for us. But in order for us to receive the fullness of God's blessing, we need to listen to what he has to say. You know, there's things that God gives us. He doesn't want us to be in fornication before marriage. What a restriction. Well, what, what if we followed that rule all over the world? You think it'd cut down on teen pregnancies and single motherhood? It wouldn't get rid of it, just mostly. Would it cut down on the desires or the need, quote-unquote, for abortion? Yeah. If we just followed that rule, do you think it would cut down on infidelities once people were actually married? You know, one thing for my wife and I, even though uh, we didn't show up uh, to the altar um, virgins either of us but we were virgins towards one another because right before we met each other i'd rededicated my heart to the lord and she had given her heart to the lord and um so we didn't have our first passionate kiss until you may kiss the bride and that was our first passionate kiss and um during our engagement I was traveling all over the world on the surfing tour. And my office was 20 to 30 feet above the beaches following summer around the world. And a lot of these beaches were new beaches. And a lot of the guys that I worked with slept with a lot of the girls that were around the contest site and partied. We we're just there a week. Why not, man? They're willing, you know? And my wife was at home in the city she grew up in where all of her old boyfriends were and where she was homecoming queen and cheerleader. All the people she partied with. And so I was out of the country for seven months that first year before we got married and I didn't have sex with her and I didn't have sex with anybody else. You think that was good for our marriage later on? As far as trust? And that built our trust. If I'm not willing to sleep with someone that I absolutely adore and love and want to spend the rest of my life with, I'm probably not going to slump lower than that, right? A and, and so, blessing. Just, just that restriction. Think about what the blessing that has. And I'll tell you what, you know, today everybody talks about homosexual marriage and you know what, I think there's special blessings in that person, for that person in heaven that fights against those radical desires in their body. This side of heaven, knowing it's a fallen world and they have fallen desires. There are special blessings for that person that says, you know what, I, I'm going to walk with God and I'm going to deny myself and pick up my cross daily. Oh, does it say that in the Bible? Yeah. And I think there's special blessings for those that have real feelings and desires that God says are wrong and they say, okay, if you say they're wrong, they're wrong. There are blessings for those people and people don't understand it. Don't you know? But these are temporal people and all they have is what is now. Why do we act like them and why do we think like them? We need to think eternally. We need to pick up our cross daily. And all of us have one. 
whether it be sexual desires or whether it be desires for uh, fame or whether it be depression or whether it be some physical ailment or pain or, you know, whatever. We pick up that cross and we say, today, God, I'm going to die to self and I'm going to walk with you. We all have one. We don't just give up. And understand that restriction brings blessing. Let me ask you guys, last time you decided to just forget God and indulge your flesh, how'd that go for you? How'd it go for you? Pretty miserable, right? Brings me misery every time. Like, you know, once a decade or so. Just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) But we step out and we just say, I'm going to do it my way. Forget the restrictions. And so we read some things like that and we go, well, God's not fair. No. God's loving and God's gracious. If if God was fair, you'd be dead. Right? God's not fair. Give me a break. God's gracious. And he loves people. I could probably do with a few more restrictions on my life. (laughs) You know? And he is worth it for me. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we do thank you for your word once again. and Thank you that we <laughs> got through the book of Numbers. But not only that, God, thank you that it was just so rich to us. And there were so many awesome things in it. Lord, you are just and the justifier. You are righteous. You are good. And you provide a way. And you are our refuge. We love you, Lord. Just help us to walk in a pleasing way that we may be useful and experience the deep joy and satisfaction of a life well lived in your presence. Lord, we would just pray for this Friday night that these kids that come whose parents are incarcerated would be blessed and that they would come to know you and that the seeds of salvation and a, and a a different life than their parents would be planted deep on Friday night. Some of these spouses and caretakers that are bringing these kids would be saved as well, God. Much of that culture is so foreign to a church like ours. May we be your heart to these people. And then on Saturday, when we turn right around and wake up early and head out to the juvenile hall, God, may we change a life and save a life that morning. May it be that we're giving out and pouring out this season instead of thinking about how we can take stuff and get what we want. May it be more about you and less about us, not only in this season, but all the time we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and close with a song. God bless you guys.